Thank you. Um, so, um, yes, the first of these topics um, today, as you can see, are an update on Court of Appeal decisions that have been made um, for the most part in 2020. I think there's one from 2019. Um, and secondly, um, Akhil uh, is going to speak to us about disclosure between the family and criminal courts. Um, if I can just move on to um, a slide showing the next lectures that we have coming up. Um, so if any of those are of interest to you, you can put them in your diary. Uh, next week, um, Modern Slavery Act, Offences and Ancillary Orders um, with Claire and Laura. Uh, and then the week after that, um, we're looking at unexplained wealth orders. Uh, and then you can see that there are lectures on cryptocurrencies, which, um, as we know, is a huge issue at the moment. Um, celebrating oxygen, and then finally the national referral mechanism. Um, there are two lectures which we have organised but are yet to arrange. Um, the first one, um, Tom Little QC, who is Senior Treasury Counsel, is currently in a case before the Court of Appeal on the use of data from third party mobile telephones. When that decision is handed down, um, he will be giving a lecture on that and we will notify you of the date. And secondly, we are looking to arrange a more detailed lecture into cryptocurrency, um, hopefully with some input from the police um, as to um, the, the issues that uh, we're all currently encountering in terms of the prosecution uh, and investigation of offences involving cryptocurrencies. Just a, a short um, introduction as to who we are. Um, my name is Jenny Oborn. Um, you can see uh, my photo uh, as well as me on the screen uh, and also um, the panels that I'm on. Um, in short, my uh, practice encompasses crime uh, and related areas. So I do a lot of work for the police, uh, particularly in areas such as search warrants and witness protection. Uh, and I'm also on the Attorney General's panel uh, for Crown Council um, and I work um, with public law related matters that have a criminal crossover. Um, Akil, who will be presenting later on, um, I've put his photograph there um, to make life easier from a presenting perspective. I will have him introduce himself when he speaks to you. Um, we're hoping that today's lecture will be uh, somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes. Um, we are conscious that Ultimately, uh, it's quite difficult to look at a screen and concentrate for any length of time. Um, these lectures are really supposed to be introductions into the issues. Um, if any of you would like a more detailed lecture um, to sit down for 15, 20 minutes, uh, talk about something that is of particular interest to you and your team, uh, please let me know. My email address is there on the screen at the moment uh, and we will be able to sort that out for you. Um, and that really brings me on to my part of this talk, which is on the Court of Appeal updates. Um, I've selected 10 decisions from the recent past, which have something of a more general um, application to the types of cases that we do. Uh, I'm of course aware that they are not all going to be relevant to everyone, but hopefully amongst there, there will be something that you can take away and will be of use to you moving forward. So let's get started. First one, um, I'm sure um, you've all come across this decision recently. Um, very important decision of Barton, uh, a five uh, person court of appeal with the judgment being given by the Lord Chief Justice. The case of Barton involved a man who ran some care homes and over the course of his time as an owner of these care homes, he um, got various residents to give him money to make him a beneficiary in their wills uh, and eventually ended up making several million pounds out of these people. The, there was no uh, issue at trial as to the capacity of these individuals. Um, the only issue was whether Mr Barton's conduct could be considered dishonest. Uh, the trial judge applied the test of Ivy that we've all been using in the last few years. And one of the matters on appeal was that, in fact, the correct test was the old test in Gauche. That is that the defendant had to subjectively know or believe 
that his conduct was dishonest uh, and that because of the way that Ivy was decided in that the test for dishonesty was uh, obiter rather than part of the main decision um, that effectively the Court of Appeal have been uh, what well, we we have been applying the wrong law for some time. Um, this was rejected and the case of Ivy was affirmed. And so the test that we should continue to apply for dishonesty is the two stage test that I have set out on the screen. This makes perfect sense in the context of the way um, uh, the law is developing. The problem with the gauche test, as we all know, is that the more warped your sense of morality is, the less likely uh, you are going to be found guilty of a criminal offence. That being said, IV and the objective test which it envisages is not without its own difficulties. Uh, we have to think whether there will be circumstances where expert evidence may need to be called by the Crown to determine um, whether or not the conduct was dishonest or not. Clearly not for straightforward matters, but perhaps um, more complex specialist work, such as, for example, the libel prosecutions um, that we had a couple of years ago, may require us to think about how it is that we're going to present that to the jury. Um, but that's a problem for another day. Uh, what we know now um, and has been confirmed by the Court of Appeal is that IV remains good law. Second case which I um, wanted to bring to your attention if you weren't already aware of it is the Attorney General's reference in Manning. Um, this was um, in relation to an allegation of sexual activity with a 15 year old. And although the sentence was unduly lenient, um, the uh, Court of Appeal upheld the suspended nature of the prison sentence. And the re one of the reasons that they did that was in relation to the impact of the current pandemic on the sentencing process. And as you can see, I've quoted um, their part of the decision at paragraphs 41 and 42. Um, you can read it yourselves, but in effect, the fact is that because um, the impact of a custodial sentence is something that should be considered when imposing immediate custody, the uh, the impact of the pandemic um, would mean that perhaps in cases where judges might otherwise have imposed immediate custody, they move towards a suspended sentence. So uh, the impact of uh, Manning, I suspect, is that you may find that there are more guilty pleas in cases which are borderline between immediate custody and a suspended sentence of imprisonment than you might have found pre-pandemic. Um, again, moving on this whistle-stop tour through some recent decisions, um, Privet was a case that dealt with the issue of fictional victims. So in circumstances where you have an allegation that the defendant has engaged an undercover police officer on some sort of chat room, and has attempted to um, meet up either with what he thinks is a child or in the case of Privet, the parent of a young child for the purposes of sexual activity. The problem, certainly as far as the Crown were concerned um, up until this decision, was a, another Attorney General's reference called Baker, where in effect Brian Levinson had said that because there is no actual victim, in cases where you have an undercover police officer, the relevant starting point for the judge is a category three. That would give a starting point of 18 months. The court in Privet um, moved away from that decision and says that authority is not a proposition um, for the, uh, is not support for the proposition that in all cases where there is not a real victim, that the starting point should be at category three. However, the approach that the judges should take is to identify the harm based on intention and then adjust down for the fact that there is not, in fact, a real victim um, who has been harmed through the actions of the defendant. Um, 
I think when looking at decisions like this, it's important to remember the prevalence of these types of offences and that they clearly cannot be in the public interest, that because um, the defendant has not, completely unbeknownst to him or her, engaged with a real child, that somehow that should afford them such a substantial benefit. Um, those of you who practice in this area will know that the starting point for a Category 1A offence is four years imprisonment, um, which is, of course, a huge difference between that and the 18 months that is envisaged in Category 3. However, the court did say at the end of the decision that there does need to be further guidance from the Sentencing Council in respect of this issue. So it may well be that uh, shortly we get some sort of help from the Sentencing Council as to how to approach sentencing of these offences. The fourth decision um, I've put in there really uh, as it's an interesting case. Um, many of you will probably be aware of it as it has been um, the uh, subject of several television shows in the past 20 years or so. Um, it is the Lady in the Lake murder. I think the lake in question is Coniston Water and the um, victim was the wife of the appellant. Um, she went missing in 1976 and he was convicted in 2005 after, his bo after her body was found in the lake in 1997. Um, this came before the Court of Appeal as a result of a CCRC referral and one of the issues, I'm um, not going to go through all of the issues, but the issue that is of most importance for us is that one of the issues was non-disclosure of material um, in the possession of the Crown that could have assisted the defence. The main piece of material related to a inmate called W. Now W had been in prison with the appellant and he said that the appellant had confessed to him that he had murdered his wife with an axe. Um, the, uh, the inmate had also told police that whilst he had previously had a addiction to drugs, he had not taken any drugs at all since 1997. What later transpired was a note from a conference between council and the police in 2004, where the police officer had noted that this inmate W was um, coming off heroin. And there was a, uh, a note next to that sentence saying disclose question um, mark. And that was never disclosed. On another date, it seems that the um, inmate was later arrested during the trial of Mr. Park for possession with intent to supply Class A drugs. That information was never communicated to the police uh, or the prosecutors in the trial of Mr. Park and therefore was never disclosed. What the Court of Appeal basically said about this issue was that there had been no bad faith on behalf of the prosecution and that there had been no breach of the prosecution's duty of disclosure. That was quite a surprising statement, particularly in relation to the note that the police officer had, because it was conceded by the Crown in the Court of Appeal that that material would fall to be disclosed, as of course it undermines the credibility of W, the inmate. Um, but the Court accepted that the, the police and the Crown had acted with all due diligence throughout and in any event, the evidence of W had been so widely discredited at trial that it had in effect been dumped by the Crown and it had relied on the substantial circumstantial evidence which pointed to the defendant's guilt. Therefore, on that basis, there was no impact on the safety of the conviction. So it's an interesting case, um, partly because of its notoriety. Uh, and once again, I think one thing that was very interesting in the judgment was the focus on whether or not there'd been any bad faith on behalf of the Crown or the police um, in, as they acknowledged, failing to meet their duty of disclosure. So we go from a very interesting case to um, the slightly less interesting issue of calculation of surcharge orders. 
course, this is not um, an area that is directly in our domain as prosecutors, um, but any assistance we can give the court in this area is generally appreciated, I find. In essence, what this decision um, said is that if you have, for example, a defendant who receives uh, two sentences, sentences of four months imprisonment to run consecutively to each other, you impose one surcharge as if it was that they had received a single sentence of eight months imprisonment. So it is the total sentence of imprisonment that matters. You do not impose separate surcharges for each of the four month sentences of imprisonment. So as again, not very interesting, but something that is important. And, and um, as we know, something that regularly um, goes wrong and has to be dealt with um, on, on appeal to the Court of Appeal um, if the defendant chooses to exercise that right in respect of other parts of their case. Um, number six, um, we're in the uh, case of voyeurism here. Um, Mr Richards um, was um, having sexual intercourse with two um, sex workers. He secretly uh, filmed them without their knowledge and was subsequently convicted under section 7673 um, in relation to voyeurism in effect of having recorded someone um, without their knowledge. The issue before the court um, was whether or not the act that the um, two complainants were involved in could be considered a private act and the definition of a private act is whether there is a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, and the court said effectively that this is all down to context um, and that whilst they did not have a reasonable expectation of privacy as it related to the activity between the three of them, they did not know and did not expect that they would be recorded and therefore they did have a reasonable expectation of privacy in that they would not be recorded. So um, the outcome of that case was that a defendant can be guilty of voyeurism in respect of a sexual act which he or her themselves participated in. Again, moving on to number seven, um, death by careless driving, always a horrible um, and difficult um, offence to prosecute um, and difficult for the courts. A um, couple of, set of judgments of relevance here. First, in the case of May, the judge had increased the sentence because of what um, they described as the need to send out a message to good character defendants who are um, causing death by careless driving, I suppose. Um, and the court found that, that there was no evidence um, in order for him to do so uh, and that courts cannot um, make an uplift in respect of prevalence without a sound evidential base. Um, dealing very quickly with a couple of other decisions um, for death by careless, um, one thing that I think we really are seeing in this area of late is the importance of remorse and early guilty pleas um, in the sentencing process. Um, because the courts are finding that the trauma that's caused to the relatives of the deceased is so high, um, as is understandable, of course, that if a defendant continues to fight to trial, then in that case, um, it is likely that the prison sentence um, would be, an immediate prison sentence would be appropriate. Sorry, I think someone else has taken control of my presentations. I'm just uh, going to take that back, if that's okay. I don't know if that was, was that you, Nicola? I'm not sure. Nope, okay. <laughs> um, let me just re-upload the presentation. Bear with me one moment. Um, and let me just
there we are. Um, right, uh, decision number eight, um, again, um, Crown and PSR, an important decision if you have a defendant who has either mental health difficulties or autistic spectrum disorders. Um, these were a series of conjoined appeals where the court considered the appropriate approach to be taken. Um, as you can see there, first point is the judges must closely scrutinise uh, mental health and um, autistic spectrum disorder. Um, both the impact of that on the time of the offence uh, and also um, later in sentencing. Um, and of course, the impact is going to vary uh, hugely depending on the nature of the offence and also on the nature of the condition from which um, the defendant is suffering. Um, as we can see and as we all know that the way that it impacts is in culpability and the impact of sentence and of course whether or not the defendant um, meets the criteria for the imposition of an extended sentence as a dangerous defendant. Um, the reason that I, I raise it particularly here is because they uh, reasserted the need for us all to be alive to the possibility of mental health um, or autistic spectrum disorders um, at an early stage. Um, certainly the evidence would suggest that um, often uh, female defendants who suffer from autistic spectrum disorders can be rather good at masking it um, to an extent that it's quite difficult to um, immediately spot that there may be a difficulty. Now, of course, that uh, responsibility falls primarily on the defence who have the majority of contact with the defendant. Um, but of course, it's important um, that we're aware of it as well. The other point that can be gleaned from the authority is the importance of focused reports. So what the court said is it's not a matter of just obtaining psychiatric pre-sentence reports in all cases. Um, we have to think when what reports are being prepared, how is this, uh, what is the issue upon which the court requires assistance and how is the resolution of that issue going to be helped by the preparation of a report? So I've included a case there called Rodis, um, which was a young man who'd sent, I think, a hoax bomb threat. Uh, and in that case, um, the court were critical of the fact that the report was very wide, didn't really focus on the issues in the case, and ultimately concluded that um, Mr. Rodis's diagnosis had no impact on the overall offending and therefore his culpability. Of course, the last bullet point relates to the difficult position that we um, have come across before where something emerges post conviction that might have been relevant at trial. And there, as you can see, the courts have put the proper basis for um, the judge to deal with that matter in that they must remain faithful to the jury's verdict, but of course take into consideration the mental health or autistic spectrum disorder at the point of sentencing. So just on to number nine. Again, we're in the low value shoplifting this time. Um, and the only reason I've included that is because it affirms the position taken in the Code for Crown Prosecutors um, that the definition of um, whether or not a defendant is charged on the same occasion does not mean when they are physically charged in the police station, but means when they appear for their first appearance before the magistrate's court. So um, what we've been doing so far has been affirmed by the courts as being the correct approach. And then last but not least from me, um, the case of Baker, whether or not you can impose an extended sentence when a defendant is already on an extended sentence. The um, argument was that it would be wrong in principle because uh, ultimately uh, extended release provisions already apply. And the court found um, that it wasn't wrong in principle that the exercise for the judge when deciding whether to impose a indeterminate sentence was whether or not the defendant posed a risk at the point at which the sentence was passed if he or she had been at large. So the judge is prevented from considering the fact that they're going to be locked up for a considerable amount of time anyway on another sentence. Mm -hmm. And um, just to finish off, because at the moment 
we are having so much horrible news in the world um, and everything seems a bit difficult. I thought I'd show a photo of my nephew who was born this morning. So there he is with my uh, sister and my brother-in-law. And that is my email address. Um, as I said before, please do not hesitate to get in contact if um, you'd like more information on any of the decisions as I've mentioned, or if there's any topics upon which your colleagues would <coughs> like um, any more information. Um, and on that note, I will hand over to Akil to look at disclosure between the criminal and family courts. Hello, hi. Um, so I'm Akil. Uh, I'm a junior barrister at uh, Nine Gough Square. Uh, 2017 call and my practice is predominantly crime and police law but of course as a common law set we draw in uh, expertise from all of the various fields that we do so I also practice in criminal uh, clinical negligence personal injury and family law and this is again as Jenny said very much a whistle stop tour uh, and whistle stop for two reasons one because of time so it has to be a whistle stop tour but also because the majority of uh, this, so this is disclosure between the family courts and criminal courts, is undertaken by the police. So the, the main question is, well, then why why would you care? Well, well you would care about this, but for two main reasons. First, the majority of it is done by the police, but that also nece necessarily means that the minority of cases uh, are dealt with by the CPS, and that generally tends to be post-charge. So if ever there's been a charge, then these obligations fall on the CPS. But second, you will also want to keep an oversight on the police because you will want to make sure that reasonable lines of inquiry have been followed. And if the police haven't been firm with the family courts or a family judge has refused to disclose something that is properly disclosable, um, you will want that material. And so we look at this uh, with, the, with, with the prism that this really shouldn't be very contentious. But for some reason, uh, there are always uh, arguments about disclosure going both ways but particularly about criminal courts getting material from the family courts. And so I'll very briefly look at the background of the legislative background and then look at the 2013 protocol, which governs uh, the relationship between um, the two jurisdictions uh, and then look through the practical steps. But the background is uh, one of cooperation and there really should be cooperation between the ju two jurisdictions. And these two cases, uh, so it's the same case, the two judgments by uh, Mr. Justice Peter Jackson uh, really demonstrates what happens when that cooperation element doesn't happen. And this was quite an interesting case. Uh, Aki, I, 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 yes. um, I don't think your PowerPoint's going through the slides at the moment. We can just see like the first page. Ah, you can't see the back. So which, what can you see right now? You just see the, the introductory slide ah. of your name. I think what you need to do is if you unshare your screen, start your PowerPoint and then share the screen, it hopefully will work. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let's, let me unshare my screen. Start the PowerPoint. And reshare the screen. Can you see the background slide now? Perfect, thank you very much for that. This was a um, case of a uh, six week old baby dying and the police had uh, covertly surveyed uh, the family. Now, of course, this is something that the family courts would want to know about, uh, but the police did not tell the family courts that this was occurring until quite a late stage. And what did that lead to? An unhappy High Court judge that said one incredibly important paragraph. The efficient process of disclosure between the two jurisdictions is essential for the proper administration of justice. But ultimately, it must be able, both jurisdictions must be able to rely on assurances that all the relevant material has been disclosed. Uh, and though in some cases, PII will have to be resolved. So those are the two key features there. It has to be relevant, for so long as it's relevant, it should be disclosed, and it shouldn't be disclosed if there is a PII element uh, in that. The law is quite straightforward on both sides. Um, from, the from the criminal investigation into the uh, family investigation, there is not much legally stopping disclosure. There'll be practical reasons why we may not want to disclose, but legally, 
there is not much stopping this glacier. From uh, the other way around, well, family proceedings are generally held in private and it will be a contempt of court to disclose those private communications or private documents without one of these three features uh, from the family procedure rules. So it's either material that can be communicated to a professional acting in furtherance of the protection of children, and that really only applies to police officers undertaking emergency action. Second, with the permission of the court, or third, certain uh, exemptions that are set out in practice direction 12G. And those are twofold. First, a party, so that's a party to the family court proceedings, be that the local authority, any of the parents, the guardian, or anybody else that's involved, can disclose and only to a police officer the text or summary of the judgment for the purposes of a criminal investigation. That's one. Well, how do we, or how does the CPS then get that material? Well, any party that is lawfully in receipt of that information, so in this case, the police officer will be lawfully in receipt, may disclose it uh, to the CPS. So a party or the police can disclose it to the CPS, uh, but for what purpose? To allow the CPS to discharge its functions. Anything else then requires permission from the court. And the key uh, and important feature for you to remember here is why do you have the material? Uh, what, for what purpose have you been given it? And for that, you always need to look back either at this practice direction 12G or at the court order that's given you that material, because otherwise you might fall into this uh, poor situation that this uh, chap Nasrullah Musselin fell into, where he was... Um, Want, a wannabe barrister. He was paralegaling at, a, at an immigration firm and he gets documents given to him by his client from the family case. And his supervisor tells him, okay, just include it in the bundle and send it to the, send it to the immigration judge. Tut, tut, I can always see some shaking heads there. Um, because that was contempt of court. And the immigration judge referred it straight back to the family judge and the family judge there and then committed him to a term of imprisonment straight away. Uh, for, for, uh, it was quite unfortunate. The appeal went through and the appeal was upheld on basic procedural grounds that um, the defendant or the defendant, the respondent in this case, had not uh, had a sufficient opportunity to represent himself, but he had committed that contempt of court through absolutely no fault of his own. He was a junior just being told by his supervisor to send the documents. He thought it was relevant, but it doesn't matter. As relevant as it is, it was private material and it should not have been disclosed. So that's a word of warning. Uh, but then we get into the, the 2013 protocol that governs and the object really is full cooperation. The protocol is divided into three parts. We won't talk about linked direction hearings. Those are not very common. Uh, and if and when you come across those, you'll know exactly what to do. Um, because chance if you're involved in those, you will know uh, the procedure very well. Uh, part A is uh, from uh, crime into family. And part B is from family into crime. Looking at part B first, whenever the local authority uh, are aware that they uh, are about to issue proceedings. Uh, they are supposed to notify the police if there are already criminal prosecution, uh, criminal proceedings underway or in contemplation, then the police are to forward this to the CPS. Your only obligation at this stage is to give due priority. I'll, I'll leave it to you to, to prioritize within the various priorities that you have, but you're supposed to give due priority to these cases. Um, and if the police want disclosure, uh, then uh, a form at Annex C of the protocol is used. Uh, if it's post-charge, then the disclosure request can either come through the police, so you can ask the police to uh, make that request of the local authority, or you are able to do that yourselves. But remember, it's only needed for court documents. So what does court documents mean? And that's the second bullet point here. Take, for example, school records. They may well be in the family court bundle, 
but that does not mean that they are court documents. They existed well before the family court proceedings, and so you do not need a court order for those. If the LA is being difficult, there is this case of re-EC that we'll come to in a moment, but it effectively says, trust every part of the judicial system, uh, be of the justice system, be that the family courts or the, or the CPS uh, and the, the police, everyone is performing their function and they must be trusted. Uh, we can skip through uh, this slide uh, of, for time, but if you're making an application to the court for disclosure, you will be making it if it's a post-charge application. It's a very straightforward and settled way of doing it. And if ever you want um, some template documents, just send me an email and I'll send you a full suite of template documents from the Form C2 that you must fill out to a template witness statement that ticks every single box to a potential uh, position statement that you could use that sets out the law. But what is key here is the order. And there's only two points that I want to raise here. First, the order must make it clear who the material is going to be disclosed to and for what purpose. Quite regularly, and this is where you need to check the order when you receive material, quite regularly, the police will negotiate in family court uh, as to the nature of the disclosure. Family courts are creatures of negotiation uh, and, and judges don't necessarily make decisions as much as they like to bring parties together and for obvious reasons. So if you have a party that's objecting to disclosure, a common negotiated settlement is to say, okay, the court will allow the material to be disclosed to the, to the CPS, but then does not include the onward disclosure to the defense that then would need to go back to the court. And so you just need to make sure that you are able to comply with your CPIA obligations in accordance with what the order says. So keep that order uh, to hand and uh, do make sure that it satisfies what you want it to do. Uh, at the hearing, again, very practical steps. If ever you don't have counsel and if you're doing this yourself, the police quite regularly do these hearings themselves just drop us uh, a line and, and we can talk you through exactly what you need to do. The test for disclosure is uh, once again, uh, quite important. There are a number of factors that are set out um, by uh, Lord Justice Winton Thomas in REEC, uh, which starts all the way from the welfare interest of the child to how important the case is, the desirability of cooperation between various agencies, but ultimately it comes down to one point. If it is reasonably necessary to have these documents for the purpose of a criminal investigation, and if it's a serious investigation, you really should be getting the material. Uh, the main quote is, the disclosure is to responsible professionals who will use the material for the purpose for which it is shared, namely criminal investigation and possible prosecution. The criminal justice system has its own responsibility and powers to protect the vulnerable. So there we are. If ever a family court is being difficult, more often than not, the appellate courts have always sided uh, with the police in ordering disclosure. Uh, some quotes of principles that you can take from, uh, from the slides, uh, which, will, which I'm, I think Jenny will send out, or if we don't send out, you can just ask us for, and um, we'll send these slides to you. Um, again, onward disclosure, make sure that that is taken into account. Um, the police just need to get the material to the CPS, but as far as the CPS are concerned, we need to make sure that the material goes to the defence in line with uh, our CPI obligations. If there is going to be sensitive material, then the usual considerations about putting on the sensitive schedule and if any PII applications needs to be considered. Admissions of guilt are a great one because there is a protection against self-incrimination um, in Section 98 of the Children's Act. But it doesn't always work in that way. Somebody uh, does not want to lie under oath and admits absolutely everything that happens, but what can you do with that information? Transcripts of that admission can be used by the police to put to the suspect in interview. 
And then everything else, and this is where you really come into this, everything else falls to the criminal trial judge to decide on admissibility and then on whether something's unfairly prejudicial. So even though Section 98 protects against self-incrimination, it, it's not really what a defendant would want it to be. And a wholly, a wholly honest uh, family court witness turned suspect um, can be under uh, quite a tricky situation. The other way around, from family, uh, from crime into family, uh, we have 14 days to respond to any requests. If uh, criminal proceedings have already been commenced, then uh, those requests will come to us. Those requests are intended to be used proportionately. Family courts are known to say, well, we'll have everything. And they'll ask us for absolutely everything. But what are our, our, our obligations when they say we want everything? Well, requests should be focused. And this is the key case. Uh, Sir James Mumby, who was the, then the president of the family division, said this. More thought needs to be given than is often the case on appropriately focused application for disclosure. Too often applications seek the disclosure of everything without any adequate thought being given to identifying the particular class of classes of documents where, uh, whose disclosure is really needed. So, yes, if it is going to be too much to disclose absolutely everything or too much to redact everything. So it's not that you care about disclosing. You can really care less whether you disclose the material or not. It's just the manpower that it will be taken to, to redact just doesn't make it practical. Say that. Uh, and the best way to do this is to just have your schedule of documents that there are and have an agreed method of which documents are actually necessary. Um, but if you agree, then disclose. But if you don't agree, raise it and raise it to the court. Don't do what happened in this case, uh, Sir James Mumby, who after retiring came back to sit uh, in Rehage. Uh, I think this is one of those examples where you could genuinely say the judge went bonkers uh, because he had a scathing criticism of the police for just simply not replying. The request was absolutely unreasonable, but people just didn't bother replying and didn't request. And then they wrote back to the court saying, um, we note your request for documents. And the judge was quite clear. It wasn't a request for documents. It was my court order. Don't call my order a request. So that wound him up as well. Um, so it was generally a very irritated judge um, being even more irritated by the parties in that case. Uh, redactions, of course, where you need to redact, you redact, but you should give full reasons as to what you are redacting for. Um, usually it will be data protection. Uh, and so this last formulation of words and the very last bullet points are, are some that I recommend just being used uh, as it broad brush tells you exactly why you are redacting. Uh, PII, I suspect you know the tests for PII very well, but these are the, and the three limbs that you're looking at. Uh, crucially, number one, that is quite important because that's not necessarily PII, it's just a basic test of relevance. Is the material that is being requested relevant? If it is not sufficiently relevant, then it need not be disclosed. And that's it. So I've met my target of finishing by a quarter to two on the dot. If there are any questions, uh, as Jenny said, please just email us at any time. We're always around to help uh, where we can. I'd just like to say thank you to both of you. I just wonder, are you happy to take questions now if anybody has any? Of course, if, if people are happy to stay a little longer than, than we said the, the lecture would be, then absolutely, we're happy to stay mm -hmm. I'll let, if anyone has any questions, perhaps put them in the chat um, and then we can let you unmute and ask the question. We'll see. Give people a minute or two. <laughs> Akil, um, my name is yeah. Jennifer Moore. Um, can I just say to both of you, though, that was really excellent. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, Akil, your um, presentation is really timely because um, I've been helping a colleague in CPS um, today, in fact, in relation to an order that's been received late 
um, made by the family court for disclosure of CPS material. Um, or if not, it's not actually CPS material, it's actually police material. And we do sometimes get these orders made without any prior notice to CPS um, and asking for us to disclose material, which is in fact material that the police obtained, um, particularly witness statements. Now, our guidance is that really those disclosure applications should be made to the police and the police should be dealing with them. Um, because certainly where you've got witnesses, if it's a question of needing to go to either manage risk to people or go to the witnesses and ask, you know, do they have any objections to material being disclosed? The police are the people that should handle those. And I just wondered if you'd got any sort of suggestions as to what the CPS, how the CPS ought to approach a situation where it is being asked for, to, for disclosure of material, which you, actually the ownership sits with the police. Yeah, it's it's a tricky one because the the, the protocol really divides it in uh, divides time into two uh, into uh, divides time on one spectrum, and that is whether it's pre charge or post charge, and that's the difficulty that's faced. Ultimately, it really should be the police that that's disclosing. Um, so there's two points that I think you raised. One is when you're not told about material. Also, when you're not told about the fact that an order is upcoming, if a party isn't given notice, and this is generally the case in, in all civil cases, if, a, if an order is made in the absence of a party where a party has not been given notice of that, then a party has 14 days liberty to apply. And so once you have the order, you have 14 days to write back to the court. And one thing to note about family judges is that they're very good with emails, unlike uh, most criminal or, or other civil judges, family judges deal with a lot of material between parties with parties by email. Simply writing to the court saying, we don't think this is appropriate for this reason, this reason, this reason, or we think that the police have ownership of this and should be the police dealing with this, um, may get you a lot more traction um, than, uh, than, than trying to engage in kind of formal correspondence. Um, so a quick email, uh, number one. Um, but actually, otherwise, I would tell the police and ask the police whether they will be willing to um, to take this on because it's their material. And going back to witnesses is something that is really not a CPS task. And so whilst the, the formal obligation may well fall on you and uh, and whilst the next questions are being asked, I'm just going to look through the, um, the protocol again. Uh, it's something that the police should be discharging the function on at the very least on your behalf, if not themselves. Um, Can I just add to that, if you don't mind? Um, yeah. Sorry, my name is Patricia Strabino. Um, so I was a family court legal advisor. I'm now um, SCP. And so I do have some experience with disclosure mm. in family courts. Um, if the orders generally are made to the police and the police often flounder in passing the order over to the CPS. Uh, so in my experience, I have found that the orders aren't made against the CPS directly. The reason I find that police uh, can come back to the CPS is actually because they're concerned about the prejudice it may cause to either ongoing proceedings or a criminal prosecution if a, uh, a charging decision hasn't been made. And that's the reason why the police do eventually come and, uh, and ask for the CPS to consider the disclosure. And often in their emails, they do say the court has made an order against the CPS, but that's often not the case if you actually ask to see the order itself. Um, so in those circumstances, I would say to a prosecutor to make sure the police have provided you with the order. And then clearly um, what Akil has said is absolutely relevant, um, then liaise with the court because you're now aware of the order. Um, and really the consideration in relation to disclosure is, especially going back to witnesses, what, what impact will it have in, in terms of your prosecution as well? So, yes, um, I, mean, that, I, I, I think you're absolutely right on that. So you can, so um, the, the orders for disclosure, so section seven of this 2013 protocol, um, the orders can be against the police and, uh, and or the CPS, absolutely right. It's nearly always against um, the police uh, because it tends to, family proceedings tend to work in a much quicker way than uh, uh, than criminal proceedings. But where it comes to this principle, if it's going to prejudice your trial or prejudice your investigation, 
then you then there is an absolute justifiable reason for you not to disclose. And I've had this argument quite recently uh, in the High Court, uh, where there was uh, where the family wanted material disclosed to them uh, that would prejudice police interviews that had not already taken place. Now, clearly, you're not going to give suspects materials that you're going to be questioning them about at police interview before the police interview. That would be absolutely a ridiculous proposition. And yet they were asking for it, and we, we successfully opposed that. Uh, generally speaking, if the material is unused or is going to be disclosed anyway, or is imminently about to be disclosed to the defence, then there is no reason. But if there's a legitimate reason not to disclose, um, and so if the police are asking your advice regarding the statements to disclose, then it's quite simply that. Is there a reason for you not to disclose? If there's a legitimate reason for you not to disclose, stand by that position and argue it out. Um, so can I also just say generally in relation to the protocol, clearly that only applies in relation to, um, well, not only, but it's mainly in relation to public law, but we also yes. get requests in relation to private, so it doesn't necessarily apply to all Correct. family disclosure requests. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much to um, Jenny and Akil. Um, we'll get the slides and we'll make sure they're circulated. And hopefully if we can get the video, if it sends, then um, we'll also put that on the internet. So thanks everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.